I can think of no better way to herald a new year than with a Parsha podcast. 2024, would you believe it? <laughs> I can't believe it's already, it's already that number, 2024. With the help of the Almighty, we succeeded in producing a new Parsha podcast each week in 2023. And we hope and we pray that we will be able to do the same in 2024. We started the Parsha podcast, I think, what was it, 2016 or something like that. And it's become a tradition unlike any other. And this year, it's year eight of the Parsha podcast. And we have a theme. And the theme is to go deeper into the Parsha. We call it DAD, which stands for Deep and Deeper to go behind the scenes, to get to the backstage of the Parsha. And we have the book of Genesis, that one we already finished, with the help of the Almighty. It's a new book, the book of Exodus, the book of Shmos. It's Parshas Shmos, with the help of the Almighty, from the Torch Center in Houston, Texas. Of course, my email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com. Let's begin. The Jewish people are in Egypt. And when they got there, things were swell because Joseph was the viceroy of Egypt and he was revered by the Egyptians. And when Jacob came, the famine stopped and he too was revered by the Egyptians. But now it's a new generation and the family of Israel is in Egypt, there's a new king who conspires and connives to depress and to destroy the nation. And he implements confiscatory taxes of enslavement. He condemns the people to work in back-breaking labor. And the nation displays remarkable resilience. The more they are tormented, the more they proliferate. The nation of Egypt is beyond contempt for the Jewish people, the more that they punish them and oppress them and torment them, the stronger they get. But they do whatever they can to embitter the life of the Jewish people. This is chapter 1 of Exodus. And it gets worse. Chapter 1, verse 15. The king, Pharaoh, he implements a policy of infanticide to kill all the newborn males of the Jewish people. And he begins by trying to reach out to the Jewish midwives. And he says, okay, if when you see the baby being born, if it's a male, you kill them. If it is a female, you let them live. And the righteous midwives refuse. Instead, they give life to the boys and they are handsomely rewarded for that. And then the final verse of chapter 1 is when Pharaoh, in a fit of crazy paranoia, he tells his whole nation, including the Egyptians, every male is, should be thrown into the river and every female should be allowed to live. And Rashi tells us that Pharaoh's decree applied even to the Egyptians because the stargazers, the fortune tellers, the clairvoyants, they told him, that the leader of the rebellion, the one who will lead the Jewish people out of Egypt, he was born, but we don't know if he's an Egyptian or a, an Israelite. But we can see that he will indeed suffer with water. And therefore, Pharaoh enacted a decree, all males must be chucked into the river, Egyptians and Israelites alike. And of course, the stargazers were correct that Moshe will suffer, with water, but that's with the sin of striking the rock and getting into water. That is what ultimately prevented, precluded Moshe from entering the land, but it wasn't this. He survived. Now, of course, chapter 2, Moshe is born. We follow the story of Moshe. He has the most curious birth story and upbringing. We're told about his parents. His father was a Levite. His mother was a Levite. And they have a child. And the child is good. The first thing we're told about Moshe. She has a, a boy and she sees that he's good. And she hides them. She hides him for, for three months. And then she cannot hide him anymore. And she does something very surprising. 
She puts them in a little box, a little makeshift ship, little floating bassinet, and places them in the water. And then his sister, which is, we, we know her name is Miriam, she's watching him from afar to find out what will happen to him. And as Moshe is floating on the Nile in his floating bassinet, the daughter of Pharaoh goes to wash, to rinse in the Nile. And she sees the box and she fetches it and she opens it and she sees the baby and she has compassion and mercy in the baby. And she identifies the baby as a Hebrew. And then the sister of Moshe, she is there and she says, let me go help you find a wet nurse. And the wet nurse should nurse the baby. Pharaoh's daughter adopts the baby, the actual biological sister of Moshe. He'll be called Moshe in a little bit. He, She goes and she finds the biological mother of Moshe to serve as the wet nurse. And indeed, Moshe is raised for the first part of his life by his mother in service of the daughter of Pharaoh, who adopts Moshe after he is weaned. Moshe is given to Pharaoh, to Pharaoh's daughter, and he is raised in the palace. And the daughter of Pharaoh names, names him Moshe. Why? Because I pulled him out of the water. Now, let's focus uh, first on verse 6. There's a conversation between Moshe's sister, Miriam, and now Moshe's adoptive mother, the daughter of Pharaoh. The sister of Moshe said to the daughter of Pharaoh, let me go and find you a wet nurse of the Hebrews, and she will nurse the baby. Why was it important to find a wet nurse of the Hebrews? So Rashi tells us something very interesting. The daughter of Pharaoh, she took the baby. The baby needs to eat. You can't go to the store to buy formula. She took the baby to all sorts of Egyptian wet nurses. And the baby refused to eat. And the baby refused to eat because the baby knew that in the future, this baby, this person, Moshe, will converse with God. And this mouth that will speak to God, it's not appropriate for this mouth to nurse from an Egyptian woman. That's what we're told in Rashi. It's a citation from the Talmud. So Moshe is a baby. He's three months old. And he's placed in a box, and his sister's watching, and Pharaoh's daughter comes and adopts him, and he has to eat, and she brings him to many different Egyptian women to feed the baby, and he refuses to eat because he says, listen, listen, this is this is a special mouth. Moshe at three months old, by the way. It's a special mouth. I'm going to talk with God. I have to make sure that the only things that, that, that go, that traverse this mouth, they have to be very righteous and very holy. So I'm not eating. He closed his mouth. He, he clenched his mouth shut when all the Egyptian wet nurses were offered to him. And then the daughter, I'm sorry, the, the sister of Moshe, Miriam, she says, I have an idea. Let's find a Hebrew woman. Maybe, in fact, the baby will nurse from the Hebrew wo woman. And indeed, that's what happened. She brings the baby to Yochavet. Yochavet is actually paid, we're told, to nurse it's her biological baby, but to nurse the adoptive son of the princess. And indeed, that is the only way that Moshe agrees to eat. So this is a very interesting idea. And it raises, of course, some questions. You know, Moshe is three months old. How did he know that he would speak with God? Was Moshe's greatness a fait accompli? Did Moshe have free will? Could Moshe have chosen a different path? Could he have failed to live up to his potential? Also, it's not clear what's wrong with nursing from a non-Hebrew woman. Is it, is it not kosher? Is it any less kosher? So there's an idea that we see in several places in the literature about the importance of sourcing your food from holy and pristine 
and pure sources. For example, we're told about the unusual friendship between Rabbi Judah the Prince, who was the leader of the Jewish people towards the end of the second century of the Common Era, and the Roman Emperor Antoninus. They were friends. And the Talmud tells us that they each had a palace and there was a tunnel connecting the two palaces. And every day, Antoninus, who we know today as Marcus Aurelius Antoninus, he would go onto the tunnel that connected his palace to Rabbi Judah the Prince's palace, and he would go study Torah, and he would and he would go study Torah with the great sage Rabbi Judah the Prince every day. And we're told that he circumcised himself, and we're told that he converted. He became a closet Jew. The Romans, the, the head of the Romans. And the Midrash tells us the backstory as to what inspired this Roman leader to want to cleave to holiness. And the Midrash tells us that when Rabbi Judah the Prince was born, this was during the Hadrianic persecutions. Hadrian made several edicts against Jewish life for example, he said he can't study Torah publicly. And that's how the great Rabbi Akiva was, was murdered. He taught Torah publicly, and he was murdered because that was illegal. That was a capital offense. On the day that Rabbi Akiva was murdered, a baby was born to the most prestigious family of the Jewish people, to the family of the Nasi, of the prince. And in addition to the prohibition against public study of Torah, there was a prohibition against circumcision, brismila. And they made a rule, anyone who circumcises, the baby will be killed. The mother will be killed. Rabbi Judah the prince is born, and the parents circumcise him. They throw caution to the wind. The Almighty says, circumcise, we circumcise. And the Romans send an arrest warrant. Bring the baby to Rome. We have to inspect the baby. And we have to mete out punishment if the crime, in fact, was committed. So the mother travels with the baby. On the way to Rome, she stops off at some sort of inn, and she meets another woman with another baby, a Roman woman with a Roman baby. And they chat, and they befriend each other. And she tells her what she's going to do. She's going to, she's going to bring the baby to Rome. And child's guilty of this terrible crime. And this kid will be executed. Along with mom. So this Roman mother says, let's do a deal. Let's swap babies. You take my Roman uncircumcised baby. I'll take your... Jewish circumcised baby, you go present this baby as yours. Baby's uncircumcised, you're fine. We'll do the swap back and all's well. And they did it. They bring the baby, the mother brings the baby to Rome. Baby's uncircumcised. Ma'am, you are free to go. Sorry for the inconvenience. They swap the babies back and the kids go their merry ways. Young Judah becomes a great sage, one of the greatest sages of all time. He's the architect of the Mishnah. The other Roman becomes a great Roman leader. He becomes the emperor. And they befriend each other in their adult lives. And this Antoninus is so drawn to Torah that he himself wants to convert and wants to study Torah and ultimately does convert and does circumcise himself. Says the Midrash, where did he have this inclination? What, what inspired him? What got into him that compelled him, that pushed him, that kind of forced him to choose a more spiritually enriched life? It was because he had a few weeks where he was nursing from the Holy Mother 
of Rabbi Judah the Prince. This milk created a change in the soul of the baby. And the soul was forever desirous of holiness. And ultimately it played out that even though he reached the absolute peak of Roman life and aristocracy, he wanted Torah. Now, conversely, we have the opposite. We're told about the great rabbi who went awry. There are very, very few instances of great sages who reached the pinnacle of scholarship who became corrupted. There's very, very, very few of them. The most notable example is the sage who went by the name of Elisha ben Avuya. He was the Rebbe, the teacher of Rabbi Meir, who is the primary author of the Mishnah. And he became corrupt, and he became a heretic, and he, and he became a sinner. And in fact, he is given the pejorative Acher, the other one. And again, the Midrash is trying to identify where did this kid go wrong? How do we have someone who became a great sage, really on the pantheon of the greatest sages of his era, who became a sinner, who became a heretic? And again, the Midrash finds a cause when he was just a tiny little baby. His mother, actually before he was even born, his mother, she was pregnant with this baby and she passed an idolatrous temple and there was the wafting aroma of the pig that was being cooked and her mouth began to water and she was salivating and she says, I got to get some of that or else I'll lose the baby. I'm so, I have such a craving. And even though technically it is halakhically okay, if a woman's going to lose her baby, she is allowed to eat on Yom Kippur and eat non-kosher. But nevertheless, she partook in the forbidden food. And in the words of the Midrash, it quivered within her, it coursed within her, like the venom of a poisonous, venomous snake. It infected, on some subtle spiritual level, her unborn child. And that created an adverse blemish, a flaw in this soul that ultimately played out when Acher, when Elisha ben Avuya went awry. So we see this idea that young children, even, even children in utero, what the mom eats gets filtered to the child. And if the mom eats good stuff, that gets filtered to the child. If the mom, God forbid, eats bad stuff, that too will have a negative effect on the child. And this is what Moshe was concerned about. These idolatrous Egyptian women who knows what they're doing, who knows what they're eating, who knows what, what they're partaking of. And all that gets filtered into the milk. And if I eat this, it's going to corrupt my mouth. And I may be excluded from my destiny of talking to God. So Moshe just closes his mouth. And he refuses to eat from the Egyptian women. And by the way, I, I know people who take this even a step further. When they're pregnant or nursing, just like someone who is pregnant or nursing is advised to not do things that are harmful physically. We, you know, pregnant women shouldn't drink alcohol, shouldn't smoke, maybe maybe no one should smoke, of course, but certainly not. That could negatively it could harm the baby. Spiritually as well. Someone who may do something which is maybe spiritually more questionable, not even something which you consume, but something which you experience, that may affect the child as well. So people have a sensitivity to that. I know people that have sensitivity to that. They would do things, certain things they would do under normal circumstances when it comes to you know, a pregnant or nursing mother. She's extra careful to make sure that the spiritual things that she partakes in are going to be ones that she wants to impart and instill and inculcate in her child. Moshe says, 
only Jewish women. That's it. Sorry. I want to write. I want, I want righteous filtration of my food, or else this mouth that may that will talk, that's destined to talk with God, will become corrupted. That's what Rashi tells us, chapter two, verse six in our parsha. Now, what's really interesting about this is that this sensitivity is featured in the halachic literature. The halacha states, this is featured in the Shulchan Aruch, in the Ramah, Yoridea, 81.7, if you want to look it up. And he says like this, the milk from an Egyptian woman is as kosher as the milk from a Hebrew woman. They're both equally kosher. However, it's not ideal. If you need to find a wet nurse, don't use the Egyptian woman. If it's possible to find an Israelite woman, use that milk. Why? Because the milk that comes from an idolatrous woman, it will harm the heart. It will clam up the heart. And it will instill bad character in the child. Similarly, says the Ramah, a woman who's nursing, she should be very extra careful to not eat anything that is prohibited. And even a child, child's not obligated to mitzvahs. Before they're, you know, before they're bar mitzvah, they're not technically obligated. When it comes to food, what you eat becomes part of you and will affect your spirituality. This is the idea featured in the halakhic literature. And the source of this sensitivity or this preference, if you will, for the most elevated food source, elevated spiritually. For a child, the source of this is the story of Moshe. Moshe, he shows us the extra sensitivity that we ought to have when it comes to feeding young children. We should try to find the most pristine, on a spiritual level, the most pristine source. And here's the question. We're told that Moshe had a very specific reason why he wanted to avoid the Egyptian milk. Moshe is not like everyone else. Moshe is the father of all prophets. Moshe is the one who is the highest level of prophecy, not just a prophet, but the highest level. He's the one who's going to give us all of Torah. He's the one who's going to have a, the ability to summon an audience with God. Every other prophet, they have to be ready for prophecy, but only if God decides to talk to them will they have prophecy. Moshe is the exception that he can summon prophecy. So how do we compare Moshe as a baby to everyone? How is this presented as, you know, in the halakhic literature for everyone? Maybe it's only Moshe. Only Moshe, who's really going to speak to God, he has to have that added sensitivity. But everyone else, after all, none, none of us, uh, let me not speak for you. Most of us, I will say, don't anticipate that we will actually have an audience with the Almighty. Or do we? I don't know. Do we anticipate that we'll become prophets? Very hard for us to think in those terms. So maybe only Moshe, Moshe himself says, I'm going to talk to God. How can I eat this Egyptian milk? Maybe that's a sensitivity for Moshe and Moshe alone. That's the question the commentators asked. And there are two answers that I want to share with you for segment number one of this Parsha podcast. The first answer is, that no, Moshe is not the only one who talks with God. Every Jew, every day, speaks with God. That is what prayer is. Prayer, we think of it as some sort of ritual that we do. Some sort of religious exercise that we, you know, we, we, we partake in. Prayer is us talking to God. 
And God hears us as much as God hears a prophet. The difference between us and prophets is not on our mouth, but in our ears, so to speak. When we talk to the Almighty, the Almighty listens. And the responses that we get, well, they're not going to be like a prophet's communication, dialogue with God. But our speech and our prayer, it goes directly to the Almighty. And therefore, just as Moshe spoke to God, we do the same. And that's a very powerful idea. We don't think of prayer in this context, in this format. But that's really what prayer is. Idea number one. Idea number two, this is a beautiful lesson about the attitude that a parent ought to have. When you have a child, you don't know what the upper limit, so to speak, of this child's potential is. What if you are the steward, you are the overseer, you are the parent of the next Moshe? When you have a child, every child is a potential Moshe, let's say, of this generation. And therefore, when it comes to a child, you have to realize the responsibility as a parent is to make sure that you do whatever can, that in the event that this child is destined to be the Moshe of this generation, you don't mess it up. The great Chazon Ish used to say that every child Actually, to be precise, almost every child, <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> has the potential to become the greatest sage of the generation. If their abilities and their skills and their potential is deployed properly, almost every child has that ability. And therefore, how can you not account for that? You have to do whatever you can to say that I will do my part in the event that this child, and most likely it's true, almost every child can do this. I will design my house and my life and the upbringing of this child that in the event that this child has that potential, it's not going to be my fault that it's not actualized. And I want to tell you, with the help of the Almighty, we're parents as well. And uh, our young, our older children were born when we lived in Israel. And um, my oldest son, Akiva, so he spent like a half a year in the Israeli educational system, which was a story for its own right, because he didn't speak a lick of Hebrew. And we sent him to like an Israeli school and then day one, the bus comes back and all the kids get off, but not our son. <laughs> and we're like, what did we do? We just sent a kid to a school. He doesn't speak a word of the language. And we put him on a bus. Anyhow, different story for a different time. We got him back, thankfully. But I'll tell you, the attitude of the Israeli educational system is this. We will do whatever we can with every one of our children under our stewardship to do whatever we can to develop them into potentially the next great giant of the generation. And I will say, the criticism is delivered here with love. The same is not true about what I've seen over here. The Midrash tells us that out of every thousand children that enter the academy, one of them should emerge as a real Torah giant. Now, the verse in Kohelis, in Ecclesiastes chapter 7 says, Adam Echad, one man, may elephant see from a thousand I have found. And the Midrash says that if a thousand students enter, you know, grade one, first grade, and they're studying scripture, 
well, maybe 100 of them will graduate to be able to study Mishnah. And out of that 100, maybe 10 will graduate to study Talmud. And of those 10, one will emerge who will become a great halachic arbiter, a great posek, a great sage who will illuminate the way for the rest of the nation. So one man out of a thousand I have found. We have to design our system that all those a thousand children are given the opportunity to become that one. And if, God forbid, there is an institution that out of every thousand doesn't produce at least one shining jewel, one crown jewel of the people, then they are not living up to their responsibility. And all thousand are potential ones, and therefore all thousand must be given the treatment, the motion treatment, to, again, to consider the possibility that they are that one. And if you don't strive for absolute greatness with everyone, with all thousand, you won't have the one out of a thousand. That's segment number one. Let's go on to segment number two. After Moshe is being raised by his adoptive mother, he matures and he goes out. Chapter 2, verse 11, Moshe grew up and he goes out to see his brethren and he witnesses and he sees in their suffering, Vayar Bisivlosam. He goes to empathize with their suffering. And he sees an Egyptian man striking a Hebrew man of his fellow. And Moshe turns to the right, turns to the left, sees no one watching, kills the guy. And the next day he sees two Hebrews fighting and he intervenes again. And they say, are you going to kill us like you killed the guy yesterday? Moshe is arrested. Moshe is tried. Moshe is condemned to be killed and he escapes. And he goes to Midian and he sees the shepherds harassing the girls by the well, and again he intervenes and he defends the defenseless. So this is like the introduction of Moshe's life. Moshe is going to go on to be the greatest leader of all time. And the first thing we're told about him as an adult is that he doesn't stand by idly when there is injustice. When he sees a Hebrew man being stricken by an Egyptian, he intervenes and he strikes and he takes action to defend the Hebrew. When two Hebrews are fighting, he does the same. He intervenes. He doesn't sit back and let the actions take their course. He goes to Midian and sees the female shepherdesses being harassed, and again, he intervenes. This is the introduction of Moshe, because this is what he this is the ground zero of the edifice of Moshe, of the greatest leader of all time. The, the foundation of his spiritual persona is that he does not tolerate evil. When he sees evil, he acts, he reacts. But there's a very uh, fascinating comment in Rashi. Chapter 2, verse 11. Moshe grows up and he goes out to his brethren. Vayarbis of Losim, and he witnesses and he sees in their suffering. Rashi says, What does that mean? He sees in their suffering. He placed his eyes and his heart to feel their pain. Moshe empathizes with the people. They're suffering, they're oppressed, they're enslaved, they're tormented. They're marginalized. And Moshe, he's after all a prince, right? But he kind of leaves his ivory tower. He goes down and spends time, identifies, empathizes with his brethren, and he sees their suffering, and it pains him. It bothers him. Fast forward to the end of chapter 2. There's a change in the tide. The conditions of the Jewish people worsen and they cry out to God and their cry goes all the way up to heaven and the final two verses of chapter 2 God hears their cry 
and he remembers his covenant to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he sees, and God sees the Jewish people, and God knows. If you compare the Rashi in chapter 2, verse 11, that displayed Moshe's empathy to the Jewish people, with Rashi to chapter 2, verse 25, it talks about God's empathy to the Jewish people. You find something fascinating. When Moshe saw the suffering, it says he placed his eyes and his heart to suffer alongside the Jewish people. In verse 25, it describes God's treatment of the Jewish people, his empathy, and it says the same thing. God's heart, so to speak, and God's eyes were placed upon the Jewish people. And this is a fascinating idea. Moshe, first thing we're told about him as an adult, the coming of age episode of Moshe's life, that he goes and empathizes with the plight of the nation. And Rashi tells us, again, Rashi's curating from the Midrashic and Talmudic sources. It says that he placed his heart and his eyes on the Jewish people. And you fast forward a little bit later, and God begins to empathize with the Jewish people, or at least we're told that God empathizes with the Jewish people, and Rashi again says, his eyes and his heart, so to speak. Isn't it interesting that there's almost identical reactions to the plight of the Jewish people? Moshe displays an empathy that we're told is his eyes and his heart, and God displays the identical empathy, his eyes and his heart. What this is telling us is that empathy from below arouses empathy from above. You want God to care about the suffering of others? When you care about them and you place your eyes and your heart upon them, God does the same. Now, the theme of empathy is featured in many places in the Parsha. Chapter 3, we have the very famous episode of the burning bush. Moshe sees a fire in the bush, and there's a fire, but the bush is not being consumed. And Rashi asks a funny question. Why is the presence of God in a bush? Why is it not in a cedar tree or a sequoia tree or a palm tree at least? Why a bush? And Rashi quotes a verse in Psalms chapter 91. God is with us in our suffering. The Jewish people are suffering. God, so to speak, the presence of God, the manifestation of God, the, manif the manifestation of the angel that's going to speak to Moshe, it's going to be in a bush in a lowly bush, maybe a thorny bush, not in a more lofty tree. So we have Moshe empathizing and God empathizing, and we have this idea of Moshe's empathy arousing and amplifying God's empathy. This idea of empathizing with others who are going through a difficult time, it's a very important one. And the Talmud tells us that it applies in all sorts of instances. The Talmud of the book of Titus, page 11a, tells us that a person must refrain from conjugal relations during a time of famine. If people are suffering, you suffer alongside them. And it brings a proof from Joseph. In chapter 41 of Genesis, it says that Joseph had two sons before the years of famine began. Why does it tell us that, that Joseph had two sons before the famine, during the seven years of plenty? It must be that the birth of these two sons are somehow linked to being before the years of famine. So the Talmud understands that to mean that once the famine arrived, Joseph engaged in celibacy. Why? People are suffering. You suffer alongside them.
the Talmud continues and says something that gets a little scary. It tells us that at a time when Israel is in pain, and one person says, mm, not my problem. I'm going to luxuriate because I can, because I'm not in pain. Says the Talmud, two angels come and they place their hands on this person's head and they say about him, they classify him. This is a person who departed from the public. Everyone else was suffering and they said, I don't care. When the public is comforted, they will not partake in it. Continues the Talmud, when the public is suffering, a person should not say, let me go to my house, let me eat, and let me drink, and there is peace to me. Rather, they should suffer alongside the public. And again, it brings another proof from Moshe. Later on in Exodus, the Jewish people are at war. The first war of the Jewish people. It's a war against Amalek in chapter 17 of Exodus. And it's a two-front war. There's a war in heaven, and there's a war down below on the physical plane. And Moses is up on top of the mountain, and on his right side, there's Aaron. On his left side, there's Hur, his nephew. And he's lifting up his hands. And Moshe, his hands got tired. And the verse tells us, chapter 17, verse 12, they placed a stone under Moshe. And he sat on the stone. Says the Talmud, wait a minute, Moshe? Moshe is at the time he's 80 years old, he's leading Jewish people, he's, he's effectively a king? Get him a throne, get him a chair, put some nice carpets, place a pillow under Moshe. Why is Moshe sitting on a stone? Says the Talmud that Moshe's rationale was, the Jewish people are at war, they're in pain, I will be there, there with them. I will be alongside with them. I will empathize with them. I will be in pain as well. This is an idea that we see in our parsha. And we see it, of course, this is a characteristic of Moshe, but this is also a characteristic of great sages throughout our history. For example, during World War I, we know this is a four-year war, and the Jews were all, all over, both sides of the war. The Jewish people were suffering. The great Chafetz Chaim, the greatest Jew of the time, he did not sleep in a bed for the duration of the war. You have a bed. You're an old man. The Jewish people are suffering. I'm not going to sleep in a bed. He either slept on the floor or on a bench. That's it. And he refused to use a pillow. Not because he didn't have one. He had plenty of pillows. He refused to use a pillow because the Jewish people are suffering. I will suffer alone beside them. Even more recently, the great Rabbi Steinman, of Steinman, passed away, I think, in, in 2017 or 2018. He was widely accepted as the greatest leader of his generation. When there was a war, he slept on the floor. Not because he did not have a bed, but because he said this idea, if the Jewish people are suffering, I will suffer alongside them. In the city of Brisk, the great rabbi, Rabbi Chaim Salavechik, who was one of the great geniuses of our history. And the Talmudic method that he popularized, that he did, that he developed and popularized, that is the Talmudic method that's studied in the great yeshivas today. And in his city, there were several large and destructive fires that ravaged much of the city of Brisk. And many of the homes were destroyed, and particularly the poorer parts of town. And the great rabbi says, until 
Every single house is rebuilt. I'm sleeping on the floor in the shul. Because you know the way it is, right? If the rabbi is fine and, you know, okay, there's a few people, the, the poor people, the less fortunate, the less advantaged people, people that aren't really power players. If their house is not, not rebuilt, okay, the, the, the world doesn't stop, okay? The world doesn't stop. The world doesn't go on. And the great rabbi says, I'm going to sleep on the floor here, in the shul, until every single home is, is rebuilt. I'm thinking, you know, there's a war happening right now. And, you know, we're in the United States. And, of course, there's an uptick in anti-Semitism, and that's a serious problem. And, of course, there are threats to Jewish institutions, and that's a serious problem. And, of course, there's a lot of harassment of Jews online, and that's a serious problem. But how many of us had to run to bomb shelters in the middle of the night with our children to get there within a few seconds before potentially a rocket, a rocket could hit our building? How many of our kids had to suffer the trauma of losing friends, of having to live in a war zone? How many of us even know you know, someone who became a, a, a God forbid, a, a widow or an orphan. And you know what? You could say, "Listen, what can I do to help?" I'm far away. I'm. I'm not. I made a donation. I helped in some way. Moshe here is telling us a way to do, a way to help. Not only is it important for us to not depart from the public, we want to be part of whatever the nation is going through, we are a partner. We're part of this. We're not going to depart. We don't have the, those angels and say, oh, you, you're leaving the public? You're out? Okay, you're out. Including when the good times happen. We want to empathize. We want to be part of what the nation is going through. And we want to help. But it's far from our mind and we don't really see a way that we could actually help. And here, perhaps we find a way to help. If your friend... If your brother is in a tough situation and you can't help them. We see from this story that when Moshe had sympathy on behalf of the Jewish people and he placed his heart and his eyes towards them and he cared about them, even though he couldn't really change the whole, there's millions of slaves, Jewish slaves. And even though the Midrash does tell us that he tried to lift Brits and help as much as he could, but he's not really helping. How could you really change? You can't really move the needle, one person. But he empathized with them. He cared for them. He suffered alongside them. He placed his eyes and his heart upon them. He carried their burden. By doing that, he aroused divine sympathy for them. Moshe placed his eyes and his heart upon the Jewish people. God did the same. And of course, God can help them. And we see this, there, there's a shift. End of chapter 2 of Exodus. God listens, God hears, God knows. And he appoints Moshe and the process begins. Now, yes, it doesn't get actualized, not in this week's Parsha. This week's Parsha, there's a step forward, two steps back. Because Moshe does come before Pharaoh and does say, say, send the Jewish people out. And Pharaoh says, no, I'll make, I'll make the conditions worse. But actually, we know that ultimately that did contribute towards the acceleration of the Exodus. So the, the, the turning point of the Jewish people is in the end of chapter 2 of Exodus. And only later on do we see how this is the pivotal turning point. And what prompted that seems to be what prompted it is Moshe desiring to help them, caring for them, looking, seeing, witnessing in their suffering, placing his heart and his eyes upon the Jewish people. And that aroused and amplified divine sympathy. You know, a lot of us are thinking, there's a war, but it's kind of old news. You know, October 7th, that's a long time ago. And there becomes like a rhythm of war. And of course, every death is a tragedy. 
when we all feel the pain, it's all painful for us to see, to see these, you know, handsome, talented, brave, bold young men dying. And it seems like every day there's more fatalities. And, you know, we think about how at least we're killing a lot more of the Hamas terrorists. And you know what? Uh, that's what happens in war. Soldiers die in war. It's important for us to, to empathize and to not forget about the pain of the individuals and to try to spend some time to think about the families that lost their husband, the parents lost their children, the people that underwent trauma, the people that are still in Gaza. Can you imagine what they're going through? And it's not just an exercise that is a noble and righteous one. I think this Parsha tells us that empathy from below arouses empathy from above. And it's a very topical lesson for us. And I will tell you that I heard from a very serious person. Someone asked this person the question, you know, what should we do now? Should we celebrate things? Should we make a bar mitzvah for our child? Should we make weddings? Should we make engagement parties? Should we go on vacations? There's a war. How can you go on vacations? And then he says, should we limit conjugal relations? That's the example of the Talmud. When there's a famine, people are suffering. You suffer alongside them. And I thought, well, you know, that, that sounds like it's, uh, you know, maybe dangerous territory because, you know, there's the downside to that. But I was surprised to hear that this very, very serious person was saying that this is an appropriate discussion. What are we trained to do during times of pain and crisis and, and tragedy? An ongoing pain, crisis, and tragedy? We're trained to, to think, I want to suffer alongside our brothers and sisters. And listen, of course, you know, if someone, if someone's life is going to be derailed because they need a vacation and they need to have some decent food and they need to enjoy themselves or else they just won't function, then, then it's just negative. It's just harmful for them to try to withhold from that. But if someone is just living their life and they have nary a concern with what's happening with their brothers and sisters... That is not the Jewish way. And while we may think, while we may think that what difference does it make? I'm far away. I have no sway. I'm not really a, the kind of person who's going to write to my congressman or uh, go uh, rally or go write something on social media. It's not my thing. We have to tell them what the Talmud says is that the, the angels will pinpoint those who are saying, I'm, I'm, it's not my problem, not my problem, not my issue. And they are excluding themselves. Very, very scary thing to be excluded, to be out of the camp of the nation. Now our nation is in crisis. We are suffering. And it's important for every person to consider this idea. We have to find a way to empathize, to feel the pain, to suffer alongside our brothers and sisters. In the shul, thankfully, they're saying the psalms every day. And yes, you know, they only say they say one psalm or two, maybe even three. And maybe it could be a bit more intense with more devotion. That's legitimate. But at least there's something. At least there's something. Some sort of sign in our daily lives that we are acknowledging that the Jewish people are are suffering, and we want to take a part in that. We hope that uh, 2024 brings salvation for the Jewish people. Of course, 
you know, the, the Gregorian calendar is not something that we really celebrate. We follow the Jewish calendar. But whenever there's a an opportunity for renewal, we think of ways that we can inject novelty into our lives, invigoration into our lives, inspiration into our lives. Whenever there's a new year, I always say, yeah, we don't celebrate New Year's, but we do celebrate New Year's resolutions. Why? Because if there's ever, ever an opportunity to say, I want to improve my life, we accept that. Any opportunity to change, to upgrade, to live a more elevated life, that is an opportunity that should not be squandered. We hope and we pray that we hear only good news from our brothers and sisters in the Holy Land and throughout the world. That please God, it's a good year for all of us. It's a year of personal safety and personal growth for us, for our families, for our communities, and for the nation, the world over. We'll try to do our part, of course, to study each week, to grow and to learn each week, to get behind the scenes, to go backstage to the Parsha from the Torch Center in Houston, Texas. This was very enjoyable. I hope it's not uh, depressing. It's supposed to be invigorating. Not, not, not depressing. Don't get depressed. Depression, it's almost never called for. It's the wrong sentiment. Pain. Pain is different than sadness. They're, they're very different things. Uh, we always point out that the uh, Mishnah tells us that when the month of Adar arrives, we increase Simcha, joy. And when the month of, of the sad month that marks the destruction of the temple, we decrease joy. But joy never turns to sadness. It's just it's just gradients of joy, more joy or less joy. The focus here is that Moshe was suffering alone Jewish, alongside the Jewish people. He was feeling the pain of the Jewish people. Not to get depressed and to get despondent and to get, you know, to just sit around and do nothing. No. To feel the pain and to try to do something on behalf of our brothers and sisters. Of course, my email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com. I hope everyone has a fantastic and splendid and uplifting week. And please, God, a fantastic and splendid and uplifting year. And I'm looking forward, please, God, to studying Torah with y'all this week and next week. And please, God, every week in 2024. Of course, the email address is rabbiwalby.com. I look forward to your questions, your comments, and your feedback.